welcome. Thank you for joining us this morning. Wherever you happen to be and find yourself on this day, we're glad that you joined us. We're going to sing a song together this morning. May you place your whole heart before God this morning and see if God shows up in your life says something new or you feel something new or different let's sing together hold me now in the hands that created the heavens find me now where the grace runs as deep as your scars pull me from the clay us to surrender to you. Give up the things that drag us down in our hearts, in our minds, in our bodies. May we relax in your hands, God, that are holding us now. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being here today, for joining us via video for another Sunday.
with Roots and Branches. I'm Cullen. I'm the pastor at Roots and Branches, and this is my wife, Jenny, our worship leader. Yeah. And uh, we are a small community, a small church in Anoka that's working on growing deeper in faith and reaching out in love. That's the roots and the branches. Get it? Um, and we are so happy to be nestled in this community where we are finding ways to make that love real, to put it into action. And we've spent lots of time thinking intentionally about what that means and what that looks like. And I want to encourage you to see what came of it. Uh, the great best ways to do that are to, to like us and follow us on Facebook. We're also on Instagram. Um, and you can also click the link that's in the description of this video that will take you to our website, rootsandbranchesmn.org. And there you can click the contact us button. And then there'll be a form that you can fill out so that you can get on our mailing list and find out all the things that we're doing. And that's also the best place for you to donate um, if you feel led so that you can contribute to what we're doing financially. We're working toward giving half of our resources away to our community. Um, we don't want to be a church that just drinks in. Uh, we want to also shower the community with blessing. So uh, help us if you're able to by making a contribution today. Thanks. Hi there. This might be the first time you've heard someone say this, but 2020 has been a hard year. So this month, we'll be featuring a series of messages that center around stories of people who faced hardship and stayed strong in their faith through it all. We're calling that series Through the Ringer, Finding Faith in Tough Times. And when we think of the faithful heroes of the Bible, we tend to think of the big names. Daniel in the lion's den, uh, David battling the giant Goliath, but there are lesser known stories that can also point us toward a life of faithfulness. And the story that I want to look at today is from the book of Nehemiah, uh, but it's the story actually not of Nehemiah, but of Ezra, the priest, and how he dealt with the people who returned to Israel from the exile. I'll read the whole story and then we'll talk our way through it. I'm in Nehemiah chapter 8, and it says, When the seventh month came, and the people of Israel were settled in their towns, all the people gathered together in the area in front of the water gate. They asked Ezra the scribe to bring out the instruction scroll, instruction scroll from Moses, according to which the Lord had instructed Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the instruction before the assembly. This assembly was made up of both men and women and anyone who could understand what they heard. Facing the area in front of the water gate, he read it aloud from early morning until the middle of the day. He read it in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand, and everyone listened attentively to the instruction scroll. And standing above all the people, Ezra the scribe opened the scroll in the sight of all the people. And as he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while raising their hands. And they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites helped the people understand the instruction while the people remained in their places. They read aloud from the scroll the instruction from God, explaining and interpreting it so people could understand what they heard. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Don't mourn or weep. They said this because all the people wept when they heard the words of the instruction. And then Ezra said to them, Go eat rich food and drink something sweet and send portions of this to any who have nothing ready. This day is holy to your Lord. Don't be sad because the, Lord from, uh, because the joy from the Lord is your strength. So in a world where our Bible came from, when one nation conquered another, they had a creative way of dealing with uh, that, that conquered nation so that the people couldn't start an uprising. The conquerors would actually take most of the people from the nation they conquered back to their country where they would be forced to live and work to bolster their economy. And this was a process called exile. And this is what happened to Israel around the year 586 BC. Uh, over time, uh, Israel gained a foothold in society and eventually they were allowed to return to their home country. And the book of Nehemiah is one story about how that happened. And in this story that I just read, people who had been in exile 
had just returned home, and one of the most important things that they did to announce that their return had arrived was to have Ezra, their high priest, stand on a giant platform and read their own scripture to them all morning long. These people had been through massive generational trauma. They were forcibly relocated to a foreign land, and they truly had been put through the ringer. And the thing they do to say, that chapter's over and a new one has begun, is to hear the reading of their Bible, the Torah, uh, the first five books of what we know as our Bible. It's often called the law, but when you read through it, uh, there's a lot of it that isn't laws. Um, it's, there's stories, stories that tell of God's faithfulness and love for the world, and that's why uh, this translation that I read doesn't call it the law, but the instructions. Um, it isn't a list of rules you follow or else. It's more of a map, and if you follow it, you discover a life that's full and beautiful. And so while Ezra's reading through these instructions, the other, pre the other Levites uh, who were trained in understanding Scripture, they walked among the people, helping them to understand what it meant. And did you notice how the people of Israel responded when they were face to face with their own Scriptures? They wept. They wept. They realized that they had not been holding their end of the deal with God. They realized that they hadn't been as faithful as they could have been. And they cried because they saw the great depth of God's love and realized that they hadn't been living in a way that reflected that love in their own lives. These poor Israelites really had been through the ringer. Their whole lives had been uprooted twice. And now they were face to face with the fact that they had been exiled, not only from their land, but from their faith as well. Many of us are looking at the state of our own land today, and we're realizing that we've been in exile for generations too. We may not have been marched to a foreign country, but we're realizing that the ideals that we've claimed were true about the place we call home have not been true for everyone. It's almost like witnessing the death of Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd worked on so many of our souls the same way that Ezra's reading of the scriptures worked on the people of Israel. Because as the people listened to Ezra read, they heard words like these. When a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you should not do him wrong. You should treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the natives among you, and you should love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Leviticus 19, 33 and 34. Or they heard these words too. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. Leviticus 19, 15. And they heard these words too. Whoever steals a man and sells him, and anyone found in possession of him shall be put to death. Exodus 21, 16. Our hearts have been broken because so many have been awakening to the reality that the work of the civil rights movement is not over. As long as the people of God like you and me remain dispassionate or neutral or uninformed about the cause of the oppressed, we're still in exile. We must work to create a better world where all people can safely belong without fear of going for a run like Ahmaud Arbery or fear of selling a cigarette on the street like Eric Garner or simply resting in your own bed like Breonna Taylor. And people of faith from every stripe are hearing the words of their own scriptures in new ways that call them not just to compassion but also to repentance. Because here's the thing, we're all pretty familiar with the ways that we sin as individuals and the ways that we need to ask for forgiveness and repent as individuals. But the Bible has just as much or even more to say about corporate sin, the ways our institutions and nations conspire to create and sustain systems of evil and injustice. Do you know why Israel went into exile in the first place? Remember, the story starts with them coming back. Do you know why they went there? The prophet Isaiah showed up to tell the kings and the whole nation that it needed to change its ways or else they'd experience judgment from God. Here's some of the words from the very first chapter of Isaiah. This is the introduction to Isaiah's larger message, and these words for, are for all of Israel as a nation. 
Isaiah said, Oh, what a sinful nation they are. They are loaded down with a burden of guilt. They are evil and corrupt children who have turned away from the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel, cutting themselves off from his help. And then I'm skipping down to Isaiah 1.16. He says, Wash yourselves and be clean. Let me lo- no longer see your evil deeds. Give up your wicked ways. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Help the oppressed. Defend the orphan. Fight for the rights of widows. Come now. Let us argue this out, says the Lord. No matter how deep the stain of your sins, I can remove it. I can make you as clean as freshly fallen snow. Even if you are stained as red as crimson, I can make you as white as wool. So there's a real message of hope there, but the hope only comes when repentance happens not just on an individual level, level. Did you hear that? But it is the whole nation that is called to repent of their stain as red as blood. We have to wake up to the very real demand for justice as our response to God's love so that we can embrace that forgiveness. Yes, as individuals, we need to repent for the ways that we've fallen short of God's expectations of us one at a time. But we also need to demand change in our institutions because institutions sin too. Nations sin too. Cities sin too. Police departments sin too. And churches sin too. We need to lean on God's grace, not just for our individual souls to be saved, but for our societies to be saved so that we can reflect God's love and people can feel safe and welcome no matter the color of the skin or the nation that they come from. These might sound like words of conviction uh, if you are a white, straight person like me. Like I said, life has been hard these last few months for so many of us. Maybe we felt exiled in our own homes, exiled from friends and family and loved ones because of a pandemic. But in light of the renewed energy we have in our society for racial justice, we're in that journey home from exile. And we're realizing that that journey has really just begun. So I want to leave you with these words. Uh, As the people of Israel wept over their collective sin in our story earlier, Ezra spoke these words to them. He said, This day is holy to our Lord. Don't be sad, because the joy from the Lord is your strength. Ezra Ezra calls the nation to joy, and it isn't just the kind of national joy We think of on the 4th of July that lights off fireworks. It's a joy that stirs the souls of the nation to repent and change. The the point of having this difficult conversation isn't to make you feel bad or guilty or ashamed. I'm not here to put you through the ringer again. The reason that we keep talking about the cause of justice as a church is because that is the direction that the tidal wave of God's love always pushes God's people until it's realized on earth as it is in heaven. And when we are caught up in that wave, when we are centered in God's unfailing love, then we discover the joy of the Lord, the joy that turns into strength, strength to do the work of justice, strength to come together and repent. And it's the strength we need for the long journey home from exile. Pray with me. God, we turn our hearts to you. You're the one from whom our help comes. And together, as your people gathered in spirit across a great distance, we together repent for the ways that we have benefited from and invested in systems of injustice and oppression. We ask you open our eyes to see the reality. The reality that there are some people who don't feel as though they're under that category of all people created equal. And may your love that knows no bounds embrace them and open wide the gates of conversation and of healing and of change. 
here and in all places on earth so that it may be like as it is in heaven. Amen. Sing along with us a song about surrender, fitting into God's really big plan and really big picture, and the scope from the beginning of time until now. Our God is amazing, awesome. We get to be part of the story. We get to fit into the flow. If only we surrender and recognize it. God of creation, there at the start before the beginning of time. With no point of spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of light and as you speak a hundred billion galaxies are born the vapor of your breath the planets form if the stars were made to worship so will I I can see your heart in everything you made every burning star a single fire of grace if creation sings your praises so will I Ah. Uh-huh.
desire You're the one who never leaves the one behind Thank you so much for being part of what God is doing here through Roots and Branches. Thank you for joining us for this video today. Thank you for having a heart that reaches out to find what God is doing and joining in. And that's what we're trying to do at Roots and Branches. I want to encourage you to, to follow up on what you're feeling today and what God might be calling you to do. What's the next right thing for you to do in response to this moment in your life and in our world? Listen deeply to your own heart because God is speaking into it even now. I believe that so sincerely. And when we respond to that still small voice of God, we're able to follow through in amazing ways to act justly and love mercy walk humbly with God.